Good evening, everyone. I'm Senator Anthony Bucco. Please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the greatest nation on earth. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm honored to uh, pray with you this evening. Really glad that they added under God to the Pledge of Allegiance. Makes me feel real comfortable. Amen? Amen. 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 Uh, in the book of Joshua, in the Hebrew Scriptures, we're reminded that stones matter. Joshua told the 12 tribes of Israel to put these stones here because someday there will be a generation who will ask, what do these stones mean? 19 years ago, we remember what happened. Some of us were alive then, and there's a generation that was not. And so we come standing here at this memorial because memorials matter. And there will be a generation that will come after us who will say, what does this mean? And so I thank you each for being here today. Let us pray. God, our Father, God of our silent tears and weary years, we come to remember that fateful day on September 11th when we lost so many family members and lives were lost trying to rescue those found amongst the rubble. We come today to remember this memorial and to never forget from what we've been through and what you've done to keep us. We're so thankful that our flag still stands and the hope that we have in this nation becoming the greatest nation that the world has ever seen. We have a hope for a more perfect union and a hope that we will never forget the painful past of our nation as we cling to a more perfect union. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, Pastor, for that prayer, Senator, for the pledge. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming here. I mean, we have a pretty good crowd. Uh, we weren't sure what we could do with the pandemic, so the freeholders were gracious enough, if you saw the drone, to have this live stream. And to those watching this at home, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure now to introduce Director for the Freeholder Board, Deborah Smith. Thank you. That is Brian Murray, our Director of Communications. Good evening. As Brian said, I'm the Morris County Freeholder Director, Deborah Smith. I would like to welcome you here tonight on behalf of myself, Deputy Director Steve Shaw, Freeholders Doug Cabana, Kathy DeFilippo, John Crickus, Tom Mastrangelo, and Typhoon Selen. We appreciate those of you who came here in the midst of the pandemic to remember and honor the victims of the 9-11 attacks. We also want to thank those observing the occasion on live stream, which has been set up for the families who could not attend today. I also want to thank our attendees, our first responders from across the county who presented the colors and stand in the field behind me. Senator Bucco for leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance to remember our great country. Pastor Sidney Williams for the invocation, the police pipes and drums of Morris County, Mike Del Vecchio and the Bugles Across America, the Morris County Sheriff's Office, and our guest speaker, Greg Manning. And in addition, I want to recognize Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill, Assemblywoman Aura Dunn, Morris County Sheriff Jim Gannon, County Clerk Ann Grassi, our surrogate, Heather Darling, and Chief Kimker of the Prosecutor's Office. By the way, he knows there are a lot of women in that list. And of course, the many mayors, council members, local police, and firefighters joining us here today. But most importantly, I want to welcome the families and friends of the victims of the 9-11 attacks. September 11th began as a picture-perfect late summer day filled with golden sunshine and clear blue skies. By sunset, it would go down in history as one of our nation's darkest days. Terrorists took the lives of some 3,000 men and women 
including 64 here in Morris County. All husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, children, friends, and neighbors. We come together each year on September 11th to mourn the loss of innocent life and to show our support for police, firefighters, EMS, rescue workers, and many others who risk their lives to help people that day. This evening, 19 years later, we assemble again. We are doing it despite the threat of rain, I think we're holding off, and despite the pandemic, because we believe we must be here. Yes, life has moved on, but we have not forgotten. And we must stand here every year to show the world and all terrorists who would try to tear this nation apart that we remain united. That is why we built this memorial. It is a powerful memorial because we can touch the remains of that terrible day. It includes three steel sections of the World Trade Center, pieces of United Flight Number 93, and soil from the Pentagon. The concrete blocks at the base signify our foundations, the things that truly matter in life, such as our family, our faith, our relationships, and our community. The water surrounding the memorial symbolizes the healing and rebirth that followed the attacks. The circular forms throughout the memorial represent the continuous of life. More importantly, the plaques around its circular base are inscribed with the names of the 64 loved ones Morris County lost to hate and extremism 19 years ago. And the ruby colored pavers on the outside of the memorial add an honor to all of those lost on September 11, 2001. This memorial was built to last, but those of us with vivid memories of that fateful day are only human. We are not everlasting. 19 years is a long time. While we will never forget, we already have a new generation of young people who are not even alive when the 9-11 attacks occurred. To some, it already may be just another day on a history test. So that is why we must never be deterred or detracted from gathering here for this annual observance and why we should have our younger generations at our side. America must never forget. We will never forget. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Deputy Director Stephen Shore now. Thank you, Director. Uh, everybody can have a seat if they would like at this point. I have the privilege and honor tonight to introduce our guest speaker, a man who has served in emergency services for over three decades and who was a fire department of the New York responder to the 9-11 attack on the World Trade Center. Greg Manning's roots come right back here to our own Morris County, a native of Hanover Township. He attended Bailey Ellard Catholic High School in Madison. He started his service with the Cedar Knolls Fire Department in 1987 as a volunteer EMT. He then went to paramedic school at Northeastern University and began working as a paramedic in 1990. In 1998, he embarked on his fire service career, starting with the Bridgeport Fire Department in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Two years later, on February 1, 2000, he was sworn in as a member of the New York City Fire Department, assigned to Engine 69, Ladder 28, Battalion 16, affectionately known as the Harlem Hilton. When the 9-11 attacks occurred, Greg and his team responded, working at Ground Zero for many, many months. Greg wanted to contribute more as a young member of the FDNY especially after the loss of 343 of his brothers on 9-11. So what did Greg do? He transferred to Squad 41 in the South Bronx, where he has worked for the past 17 years, 
and become a member of FDNY's Special Operations Unit. His subsequent experiences as Special Ops member have taken him to New Orleans in 2005 to deal with Hurricane Katrina, to Haiti in 2010 following a devastating earthquake there, and to North Carolina in 2018 after Hurricane Florence to support the search and rescue efforts there. In addition to his career as a fireman, Greg has continued to work as a paramedic. In 2014, he became a flight paramedic with Atlantic Mobile Health Air 1 and Air 3. But there's more. In 2018, he started another chapter of service in his newest career as a nurse at Newton Medical Center working in the emergency room. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to welcome FDNY and Morris County's own Greg Manning. Thank you, Steve. It's hard to believe I did all that stuff. <laughs> it's hard to believe it's been 30 years. Um, thank you for that introduction, and I'm honored and humbled to be here today. First, I want to thank the County Administrator John Bonatti and all the Morse County Freeholders for their courage to continue with this year's Morse County 9-11 ceremony. Unfortunately, other municipalities and cities have chosen to forego this year's anniversary out of due caution because of the coronavirus. Now more than ever, we need to never forget what was accomplished on that day. There are countless stories of regular people who stepped up to help out knowing their actions would put their lives in jeopardy. This is my story of what I experienced on 9-11. I worked with guys who cheated death that day, and they have truly amazing stories to tell. I only had a year and a half on the job, and I was working in Co-op City in the North Bronx. The morning of September 11th, 2001, was a beautiful morning. A sunny sky, low humidity, it was a perfect day. That day was supposed to be family, <clears throat> excuse me, that day was supposed to be family day in the Manning household. I was about three quarters of the way finished with the construction of our house, and all of my free time was dedicated to finishing our home. Sherry and I have a daughter, Sarah, who was almost two at the time, and Sherry was pregnant with our second child, Timmy, who's actually here today as a volunteer fireman with Morse Plains. I remember getting ready to leave the firehouse with a backpack over my shoulder wishing the brothers a safe tour. Then the, voice, then the voice alarm announced a second alarm has been transmitted for box 8087, the World Trade Center. I remember thinking how unusual this was because that area of Manhattan doesn't get many fires, especially the World Trade Center. We then changed, we then changed the channel and the TV from whatever sports broadcasting we were watching to the local news. We then saw the North Tower of the World Trade Center complex ablaze. The news was reporting that a plane had crashed into the building. We all commented on how the brothers down there had the work cut out with, for them with this fire. By now the fire had escalated to a five alarm fire and we were listening to the chaos that was developing over the department radio. <clears throat> I called my wife Sherry and asked if she was watching the news. Her response was, I'm watching Clifford the Big Red Dog with Sarah at the time, that was her favorite program. I told her that a plane had crashed into the World Trade Center and I'd be late coming home. As we were talking, the second plane crashed into the World Trade Center. I told her that I had to go. It would be at least four hours before Sherry and I would talk again. As, as we watched the fire on television and listened to the radio traffic, it quickly became apparent that this was no ordinary high-rise fire for the FDNY. As we watched the second plane slam into the South Tower, Tower, we knew something was terribly wrong. They immediately transmitted a fifth alarm for the second tower. We had a spare engine in quarters and we started to get it into service. As this continued to evolve, we soon realized that this was not a random act. We were under attack. For the first time in fire department history, the FDNY issued a department-wide recall for all members to report back to work and all members getting off shift were to stay on shift. I quickly changed back into my work uniform 
and prepared ourselves to head down to the World Trade Center. Our firehouse was a recall point, so that any fireman from point, points north of us would report here. We quickly commandeered a city bus to transport us down there. Once we had 30 firemen and some officers, we would head out. We wanted to get down there as fast as we could to help our brothers out. We gathered as much equipment as we could fit onto the bus. We then watched in horror and disbelief as the first tower collapsed and then the second. We headed, we headed out shortly after the second collapse. As we got onto the Bruckner Expressway, we could see a huge column of smoke rising from the site of the World Trade Center. Emotions were running extremely high on the bus. I remember one of the guys I worked with couldn't get in touch with his wife who worked at the World Trade Center. As we continued our drive downtown, I remember looking out and seeing one of the police precincts completely surrounded by sanitation trucks as a form of protection against whatever might come next. I guess at that point it really started to sink in that we were under attack. The drive downtown took about 25 to 30 minutes. We had split up into several different teams and were coming up with a game plan. We had expected to continue the rescue effort down there. We knew we lost brothers, but none of us could fathom that it would be so many. We reported to a staging area on West Street, about five blocks north of the World Trade Center. We had arrived about an hour after the second tower had collapsed. Seven World Trade Center was on fire along with several other buildings. Each building on any other day would have been a multiple fire, multiple alarm fire, but today they were nothing to compare to what had just happened. We were at the staging area for what seemed like an eternity. At some point during this waiting period, I was able to call home. Sherry, <clears throat> excuse me. Sherry had not heard from me for at least four hours. I didn't realize that she had no idea where I was. I learned recently that Sherry and her father had been on the phone when the first tower collapsed and she described a long unsettling silence as neither one knew what to say. We had expected to go right to work and help the thousands that would need our help. Everyone that could walk was already walking north or made their way to the ferry heading to Jersey for refuge. Unfortunately, everyone left at the World Trade Center was beyond our help. As, I, as, we, as we wait, I'm watching this seasoned chief sitting several feet from me covered in dust and dirt. He has what I interpret as a shell-shocked look on his face. I asked him if he was okay, and he gives me a nod that he is, but the look on his face says something totally different. As we continue to wait, we watch seven World Trade Center burn. We are only fighting it from the outside as we are limited on manpower and are having water problems. We watch the fire go from floor to floor. Seven World Trade Center was a 47-story office building. I remember talking to a lieutenant from a nearby company when Seven World Trade Center collapsed. It was surreal watching this mammoth building collapse. Shortly after the collapse of Seven World Trade Center, my captain at the time made a decision that we had done enough waiting around for orders and it was time for us to go to work. We needed to do something. We made our way toward uh, the World Trade Center and came across Squad 41, the company that I've been working for for almost the last 18 years. Their rig was completely stripped of all its equipment. The brothers were trying to use whatever resources they could find and get as, and as we got closer, it looked like it snowed ash. It covered everything. The whole scene is something from a disaster movie. I remember seeing one-on-one -on -one truck partially buried and crushed beneath the north bridge that went over West Street. As we climb underneath the north bridge, we are met with a wall of collapsed steel that is at least 30 feet high. The collapsed walkway had partially obscured the destruction on the other side. We can now see crushed fire trucks beneath the steel along with ambulances, battalion trucks, and police cars. To move all the steel, we're going to need cranes and lots of them. We only recovered one person that night and it was only their torso. Little did we know at that time that finding a whole person would be the exception, not the norm. Everything was pulverized. 
We continued our way over to Engine 10, Ladder 10. Their firehouse was right in front of the World Trade Center complex. They were the first units to arrive. The pile of collapsed steel was even higher on this side. It's amazing their firehouse is still standing. The truck bay is covered with debris at least 10 feet high and into the firehouse. One of the guys from Co-op City was on rotation in Engine 10 and Ladder 10, and we were trying to figure out if he was working. We later found out he was off that day. We continued to look for other guys that we weren't sure if they were working or not and if we can get in touch with them. All through the night and into the morning, we continued to do whatever type of surface rescue we could. We needed those big cranes. At some point in the early morning, we came across Engine 26. My good friend Dana Hannon was assigned to that firehouse. The fire engine was still intact, but the front end was pretty beat up with the windshield blown out. His name was on the writing list. That meant he was working that day. In the days to come, we would learn that he was one of the 343 brothers we lost that day. At some point on the morning of September 12th, we made our way back to the North Bronx via another commandeered city bus. I remember being extremely angry, angry at what happened to us as a country, angry at how many people had died, angry because I felt like we didn't do enough. I was just plain angry. When I arrived home, I remember Sherry giving me a list of people who had called to see how we were. These, includes our, these included our closest friends and family to some fairly obscure acquaintances. This was a very emotional experience. I couldn't wait to hug and kiss my family. The following day, I reported back to the firehouse, and we were promptly sent back down to continue with the rescue efforts. I remember on the way in, there was no one on the road. I think the bridges and tunnels were still closed to non-essential personnel. As I passed each overpass along the highway, they were covered with American flags and words of encouragement and support. It was extremely motivating. As we continued with the rescue efforts for our brothers, we started hearing stories about how fate played a part in whether you lived or died that day. Some guys made a last minute switch to be off that day and survived, while other guys took an overtime tour that would be their last. One guy told me he was relieved early from one company, only to have that whole company killed. Then he was trying to get back to his company that responded down there, and they all were killed. The next six weeks, I would be working the night shift down in what was now called the pile. This was a 24-7 rescue recovery operation. Instead of going to the firehouse, I would report down there. During the first two weeks down at the pile, just about any first responder could make their way down to help out. I remember working alongside some California firemen that boarded the first available plane to New York. They took their vacation time to help us out. During the first week, there were fire companies from New Jersey and the surrounding New York communities that helped staff our firehouses. When we took a break, there was always a smiling face serving us food and offering words of encouragement. These people volunteered from all over to do whatever they could to help us out. As we switched from our rescue mode to recovery mode, we switched our focus on trying to recover as many of our brothers as possible. It was a solemn event when we came across one of the brothers. If we were able to identify who they were, usually from their turnout gear, his company would then be notified. They would then come down to the pile and help us remove him. Once the brother was disentangled, he was placed in a Stokes basket with an American flag draped over it. His company would then carry him out. All work in the immediate area would stop for the removal. Remembering 9-11 is not about what I did or saw that day. It's about paying tribute and remembering those that died that day. Some innocent bystanders, some were innocent bystanders, but others knowingly fought to the end. It's, it's important we remember who they were. When I went to Squad 41 almost 18 years ago, one of the senior guys pulled me aside and introduced me to the six guys that we lost that day. We have a picture of each guy displayed in our house watch, and now I want you to, to learn about them. The officer for Squad 41 that day was Lieutenant Mike Healy. He was an 18-year veteran of the FDNY, a good athlete, coached lacrosse, was a good cook and had ears similar to mine. 
Uh, Fireman Bobby Hamilton was the chauffeur and senior man on the rig that day. Larger than life, six foot firehouse character who also enjoyed helping the neighborhood kids with their bikes and always made sure the firehouse Christmas party went off without a hitch. Fireman, Fireman Thomas Cullen was going to go to law school if he didn't get into the FDNY. Loved playing with his young son and two of them enjoyed playing with model trains. Fireman Mike Lyons, his personality and sense of humor always seemed to win people over as a kid thought being a fireman was going to be the best job in the world. Fireman Greg Sikorsky, a true jack of all trades, a marine, licensed pilot, skydiver, and a mechanic to name a few. Fireman Bruce Van Hine, a family man with a strong faith and love of the outdoors. The last person I want to introduce you to is my friend Dana Hannon. He was on rotation 26 engine in Manhattan. He and I were firemen together in Bridgeport, Connecticut, before we came down to the city together. In Bridgeport, we worked in the same firehouse. He was a great fireman who always seemed to know what to do and where to go. <clears throat> he loved to fish and hunt. He loved being a fireman, especially an FDNY fireman. The FDNY lost 343 firemen on 9-11. We have lost an additional 227 firemen to 9-11 related illnesses since then. That average is out to 12 firemen a year or one fireman a month that dies of 9-11 related illnesses. Moving forward, it's imperative we not forget what happened on 9-11 and the feeling of unity we had as a country. People from all over bonded together to help in the rescue and recovery operations at the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. In closing, I want to leave with you, I want to leave with you something that Father Michael Judge said. He was the chaplain of the FDNY and is considered one of the first fatalities of 9-11. This is part of his last sermon that he gave on September 10th, 2001, at a dedication ceremony. That is the way that is the way it is. Good days and bad days, up days, down days, sad days, happy days, but never a boring, never a boring day on this job. You do what God has called you to do. You show up. You put one one foot in front of the other. <clears throat> you get on the rig, and you go out and you do the job, which is a mystery and a surprise. You have no idea when you get on the rig, no matter how big the call, no matter how small the call. You have no idea what God is calling you to do, but he needs you, he needs me, he needs all of us. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, for that poignant story. I now need to introduce freeholder Catherine DiFilippo. Good evening, and thank you. Thank you, Greg Manning, for those very touching remarks and for sharing the history of your friends that you lost that day at your house. 19 years later, and it's still very tough for a lot of people, and God bless you and your family. Welcome, everyone. I'll invite everyone who wants to join us in a candlelight ceremony. Pick up your candle, and we will have them lit. Traditionally, a candlelight service is intended to be a way for groups of people to join together, to quietly reflect, or to simply show support for one another. So let us all light our candles and remember by name each of the 64 Morris County residents and all of the souls who lost their lives that terrible day in 2001. Please join your neighbors in lighting your candles. Um, and our buildings and ground staff are around to help us start candle lighting. Thank you.
Donald Leroy Adams. Margaret L. Benson. John Paul Bocci. Martin Borsuski. Dennis Buckley. Seal M. Kajugla. Liam Callahan. David G. Carlone. James Leslie Crawford, Jr. Joseph DeLuca. Captain Robert Edward Dolan. Antoinette Duger. Greg J. Froner. Elaine F. Gentul. Deborah Lynn Fisher Gibbon. Paul Stewart Gibley. Gail R. Green. Eileen Marsha Greenstein. Gary Robert Haig. Timothy Robert Hughes. Anthony P. Infante, Jr. Jason Kyle Jacobs. Jun Ku Kang. Lucille King. Angela R. Kite. Robin Blair Larkey. Thomas V. Linehan, Jr. Sean Patrick Lynch. Simon Madison. Alfred Russell Mailer. Christian Hartwell Maltby. Hilda Marson. William J. Martin, Jr. Philip W. Mastrangia. William A. Matheson. Robert D. Matson. Patrick J. McGuire. Martin Paul Mickle Stein. Seth Allen Morris. Peter Motusi Motus. Alexander Napier Jr. Michael O'Brien. Michael John Pesherine. Thomas H. Polemus. David Allen James Rathke. Richard C. Rescorla. Antonio Augusto Tome Roca. James Romito. Stephen Howard Harris Russin. Maria Teresa Santillan. Matthew Carmen Salito. Karen Lynn Seymour Dietrich. Barbara A. Shaw. Francis Joseph Skidmore, Jr. Michael C. Cerisi. Thomas S. Strada. Edward W. Straub. Kenneth J. Swinson. Dennis Gerard Taramina. William R. Testi. Peter Guider Wallace. Matthew David Yarnell. Mark Zangrilli. Kenneth Albert Zellman. Thomas Zabella. Thank you, freeholders Thomas Trangelo, Doug Cabana. And now we have freeholder Typhoon Selen, who will do the closing. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, you may extinguish your candles. I can call more participant fire department if you can't. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Morris County Freeholders, I want to thank all of you for coming out this evening, as well as those who are watching via live stream. I also want to thank everyone who had a part in today's observance, all of the first responders, our elected and appointed officials, and many people who worked to prepare today's ceremony, especially Chris Walker and County Buildings and Grounds Department. Also, special thanks to Greg Manning for reminding all of us why observance of today is so important. This will always be a time when we remind ourselves that we're bound together as Americans by our shared history, good and bad, no matter our differences. We have members of Christian, Jewish, and Muslim faiths on the freeholder board. But we see this as Americans are serving fellow Americans. We must keep faith in that common identity. The terrible attacks that bring us here every year were attacks on America and all Americans. We hope all who visit this memorial today and throughout the year, especially families, who lost loved ones 19 years ago, find this to be a place of comfort. As this remembrance comes to an end, we invite you to take some time to reflect at our 9-11 memorial. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless America.